Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian Literature for the Inebriated. I'm Matt Garasimovich, PhD student in Russian Lit. And I'm Cameron Lalana. This is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and maybe a drink or two. This week, we are sitting down with the esteemed translator, Robert Chandler. Robert Chandler's translations from Russian, mostly for the NYRB classics and vintage classics, include works by Alexander Pushkin, Nikolai Leskov, collections of stories and memoirs by Tefi, and novels and stories by Vasily Grossman, Andrei Platanov, and Hamid Ismailov. He's the main, main translator... He's the main translator of three anthologies of Russian literature for Penguin Classics, of short stories, magic tales, and poetry. His most recent publications are Pushkin's Peter the Great's African and Vasily Grossman's The People Immortal, both, co- both co-translated with his wife Elizabeth. His next publication will be Potanov's long novel Chevengur. Robert, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. As everybody knows, we just did our, our long 10-part read, our epic read, <laughs> of Stalingrad, so we're very grateful to have the one of the translators of Stalingrad here with us um, to discuss it a little bit more. So I wanted to ask you what specifically kind of spoke to you about Grossman. I know you've kind of addressed this in, in a few other interviews, but what, what drives you to Grossman in particular, as well as Platonov, um, since of course there are so many works, there's no shortage of, of Soviet and Russian works about World War II. Um, I think he just writes ex- extraordinarily vividly. And um, I also have a very strong sense of, um, I mean, he writes about some very, some very terrible things, Stalingrad, Treblinka, and so on. Um, but I don't ever get the sense that he's um, sort of doing this um, because he wants to hurt the reader, which is you know quite common, quite often writers feel some deep pain themselves and sort of think they can get rid of it by inflicting it on someone else. Um, Fate took him to these places and um, I think he just felt a a moral obligation to write about them as he writes about them in a very level-headed way. He's a kind of wise guide. I see him as a, a kind of Virgil guiding Dante through the Inferno. And he does it calmly and wisely. And he is actually um, always kind of looking for moments of tenderness and good, even in these terrible places. So um, a lot of his, you know, they're quite, well, in the life and fate, um, the moment in the gas chamber when the Jewish woman doctor, Sofia Osipovna, feels that she has become a mother as she kind of looks after this little boy when they're both just about to to die so um he's not sort of looking for he's not just looking for pain for the sake of it so i had a a question about kind of the translation of stalingrad and just kind of your approach more uh generally and actually a little bit the question is about your wife elizabeth i mentioned or I, I read in one interview that you mentioned that she doesn't speak russian at all but that she is really excellent with idiomatic phrases and rhythm and the sort of visual preciseness that uh, she can bring into english and i was wondering kind of if you could speak a little bit more to that in the role of translation i feel like oftentimes in schools when we learn russian we learn okay a translation is to take this phrase and we translate it literally uh, the most precise way that we can translate every word uh, without this sort of uh, scope, I guess, of the idioms and uh, sort of the rhythm of the author. And so, you know, kind of what are some of these non-textual elements that you tried to incorporate while you were going through Stalingrad? Um, when one knows the Russian, if the Russian is in one's head, um, one can often fail to notice you know, because one knows what it's meant to mean, um, one can fail to notice that the English is totally unclear. So sometimes if I've left a translation for six months, which is a you know, very good thing to do, if one has the opportunity, um, then I will look at it again and I will come to a sentence and I think, God, what the hell is that meant to mean? And 
I, I, I look at, have to look at the Russian to see what it's meant to mean. Um, so obviously, you know, having my wife there who doesn't know Russian, um, you know, shortcuts all that, she will immediately notice something. I mean, a kind of blindingly obvious little moment I found in someone else's translation just the other day was um, someone had translated um, Straitsilne Sujet as building plot. Well, Straitsilne means you know, to do with building or construction. Sujet um, does indeed mean plot, as in you know the plot of a story, the plot of a novel. But you know the phrase "building plot" in English, blindingly obviously, <laughs> sounds like a plot <laughs> of land, but <laughs> land on which one is going to be building a house. Well, you know, one can make these. Everyone can make these kind of mistakes. We all. I sometimes notice myself that it's often when there's been a really genuinely difficult um, problem um, that I've given a great deal of thought to. And maybe in the same sentence or very close to it, um, I will sort of slip over some very simple little thing and make some rather silly mistake. Um, an example of that, I can't remember what the difficult thing was, but there was a very difficult sentence in Stalingrad. And um, and in it was you know, quite separate from the difficulty um, was a the adjective electronne, and I just unthinkingly translated it as electronic, which you know many people might do, but actually, you know, in the context, it was entirely clear that it meant having to do with electrons. You know, this is an atomic scientist, so you know one can make these silly slips. An extra pair of ears, an extra pair of eyes, inner eyes is very helpful. Um, so speaking of the the kind of collaborative nature, or at least having someone you know check the uh, from an English side understanding of idioms and the way things are translated, um, we kind of I think and a, a layperson might assume translation work is a pretty solitary activity, sitting down, really just going through the text, working uh, working through. And from some people, it may be, but you know your work historically has been incredibly collaborative. Not only do you translate with your wife, but you have some some long term collaborators, um, from historians and other academics who you know provide footnotes through a lot of your novels. Um, and so it seems like your approach is is more collaborative. And we want to talk about the kind of the nature of that, of like what how you came around to you know bring so many people into your work. Um, actually, a great many translators I know do do work in a very collaborative way. Um, that's probably changed quite a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I mean, a lot of... There's a program that's been, I think it was started about 12, 15 years ago in this country of um, mentorships. I think it's been followed in the States. Um, you know, you've got your own one now. Um, so um, that's usually been in about 10 different languages each each year. It's one-to-one, -one, um, working with a, a mentee for six months. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people I know who have worked as mentors will, you know, they will then um, collaborate in all kinds of different ways with the with their mentee, and it's an, an obvious thing to do. I mean, and, and it can be in all kinds of different relationships. It can be um, the mentee doing nearly all the work, and all one's doing is just kind of checking a few details and um, trying to help the mentee find a publisher. Um, or it may be, you know, I mean, one never knows. If, um, it's 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 very hard to judge how well someone else is going to be able to translate. So you know, sometimes I've um, chosen mentees who've been absolutely brilliant right from the start. Sometimes I've got it wrong, and sometimes there are people who can be absolutely brilliant in particular realms, but not in others. So kind of collaboration is a way of sort of test testing the waters. And then, um, they, you know, then there's collaboration with people who are, um, who know a great deal more than me, like 
and the scholar Olga Mersen at Georgetown University. Um, you know, she she's married to an Orthodox priest. She knows philosophy really well. She's lived her first twenty years or so in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, she's and she's written books about Platonov. So, you know, she's someone I I really, really learned a huge amount from. Um, the people who just have a lot of factual knowledge, Natalia Dujina, one of the best um, scholars in the Platonov group, um, bring out a collected edition of his works in in Moscow. You know, she's done a colossal amount of research. Um, looking at, well, especially at newspapers of the time, and you know, just um, establishing how many, often of the very strangest, most apparently surreal details in Platonov's texts, um, how actually um, closely, closely related they are to some you know, speech by Stalin or article in Pravda or whatever. So you know, there are all kinds of different different ways in which another person can help. Yeah, I think that's some of the benefit of getting something that's been retranslated as well as, you know, there's more facts that kind of come to light over, you know, longer periods of time as they've been looked at by more and more people. You get a sort of more comprehensive view of the novel or the story or whatever it is you're translating. Well, I am glad that I um, I translated a few pages from Chivangur over 40 years ago and tried unsuccessfully to interest a publisher. Um, I translated the first section, about 80 pages, um, a little over 20 years ago, and then I've been kind of endlessly delaying over doing the novel as a whole, um, partly because, you know, other things just kept getting in the way, but um, I also did have the hope that eventually the, um, the Platonov group in Moscow would get round to bringing out the um, Chevingur in the kind of complete scholarly edition of Platonov, and um, they have finally done that, and you know the commentary is very, very useful. Sure, sure. I have some more specific questions on Stalingrad that I would be curious to kind of hear how you read it or hear your opinion as someone who's been absolutely, I assume, immersed in this uh, as you're going through and translating. I mean, it's an enormous task, of course, but. Um, we had some questions just that we had thrown out while reading uh, about Grossman and some of his approach to literature and on some more sensitive topics, I guess, at the moment, I guess, um, specifically his attitudes or how it comes through in his writing towards people from other Soviet republics. He does this thing that sometimes we do on the podcast and sometimes scholars and people working in the field do where you interchange Russian and Soviet when they're not really interchangeable. Um, he sometimes will discuss this sort of camaraderie of the many different nationalities uh, that forms on the front line, but he sort of fails to reckon with the level of destruction that happens actually on those territories of the same people that are kind of you know, in this sort of for, forming this bond on the Russian territory, it's sort of maybe not pushed to the side, but it's not perhaps the focus. And you could argue, of course, this is not the focus of a book called Stalingrad. Um, but I would argue perhaps Stalingrad is not really the focus of the book Stalingrad either. Um, so I'm kind of curious how you read this very kind of complex situation with Grossman and these other nationalities that are part of the book as well? Um, Grossman was certainly very much of an internationalist. Um, a lot of his more positive characters are kind of old Bolsheviks connected to the communist international, the Comintern, and so on. He gives Kremov in the Stalingrad novels is one of these, and Kremov He's not exactly a self-portrait of Grossman, but Grossman does give quite a lot of his own experiences in the war to Kromov. Um, I don't have any doubt of Grossman's strength of feeling with regard to the treatment of other nationalities. Um, there's certainly a passage, which I won't be able to remember the names immediately, but there's, I think it's in Life and Fate when um, 
Novikov, Colonel Novikov, a very, very positive figure indeed. He gets into a, a fight, I think, with his um, with his commissar, this kind of parallel rank commissar, um, a fight because Novikov wants to wants to put a I'm not sure of the nationality. It might be a Tatar um, to give him the command of a brigade. And the, the political officer wants a proper Russian to be in command of the brigade. And um, you know, there's no doubt about Grossman's sympathies there. And um, we, on a more tragic level, um, this was actually something I didn't know about myself until I was um, translating um, Everything Flows um, later politically still sharper novel um there's quite a lot there about the the genocide in the late 19th century uh, directed against the Cherkassians and the hero of everything flows is sort of noticing you know just little little sort of remnants of um Cherkassian and maybe Tartar Tartar villages that had been destroyed by the Russians. Um, so um, I think Grossman's pretty strong and clear on, on those subjects. Definitely. So in regards to, in, in similar kind of c continuing along this topic of similarly kind of sometimes difficult questions, we also, we recently read uh, the Sistine Madonna and we found that, uh, we found like there's the sense of responsibility that Grossman kind of points back towards the reader which is maybe not common to other stories at the time. It's it's like not just a description or a story, but it's something that's like actively involved in. It's a sort of a historical reckoning, and it involves the reader, um, in 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 its understanding. Um, is it? Spe it specifically involves readers and people across generations, um, and it's not just like limiting it. Like the the scope of the story is not just limiting it to those who are alive for the events that he's talking about in the Sistine Madonna. Um, so can you kind of in this way um he kind of reminds us of arlem shalomov um solzhenitsyn is more popular in the west because of you know for various reasons um but um can you talk to sort of some of the ways like in the writers in this time uh Platon and grossman especially maybe were, were coming to these reckonings and like trying to talk about the issues of their time especially ones that were not super like in ways that were not necessarily going to be read by by the public maybe in their kind of private lives um what comes to mind there is um an unexpected sentence in the passage i've already mentioned about sophia living to on in the gas chambers and um grossman does i mean it's a been a consistent sort of third person narrative i think throughout the whole book and then um grossman does very very suddenly address the reader then you know he does suddenly you get a, a you which is so unexpected that i think that my first time i translated it i kind of just normalized it i just sort of didn't take in what a sudden break this was and um somebody had to point this out to me and i changed it in, in a revised edition um so um I'm not quite sure I fully understood everything you're asking, but he he certainly is um, wanting to make the reader think about his own responsibilities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I maybe mean, it wasn't quite clear. It's like there's there's a lot of calls to action in Grossman's work, where kind of like a, a kind of demand to understand your era. I, he talks at one point. I don't remember if this is actually in Stalingrad or if this is something that you've written about him. That there's a, sort of a like a desire to. Bring the reader into a reckoning um, i mean you see this in i want to say it's the hell of treblinka where he like calls upon the reader to like destroy like the wolves of future generations and um um i think i want to say it's in the Sistine madonna where, where he talks about like main at least you know, there's not a lot to say about his generation but at least they maintained you know the spirit of humanity so like, there's this very like a awareness of this era not just in terms of like the writers and you know other considerations but what he's writing he's really talking about like you know a sort of philosophical approach to the human condition as a whole um and it, this i mean it's like a sort of not not just questions that's just for the writer you know for grossman himself but like trying to call the readers into it to think about it as well and um i, I guess yeah it was kind of 
getting at what, what I was asking. I think you kind of answered it. And um, also in um, Everything Flows Again, which I do think of as one of his very greatest works, and there is that very striking chapter where um, different, different, there's a sort of trial of different Judases, different people who have betrayed, um, you know, who have denounced and betrayed colleagues. And um, in each of these trials, you know, there's a, I mean, they are like mock trials with a prosecutor and a defendant. And, you know, the reader is constantly being forced to change their mind. You know, each time it looks as, ah, oh, yes, you know, this man really is guilty. He really, you know, he really does deserve to be punished. And um, then um, all kinds of extenuating circumstances uh, brought out by the defending counsel. And it really is, you know, the reader is constantly being forced to question their own judgment and to change their minds. Um, this is something... This is actually a translation issue. Um, I remember, again, with Everything Flows, there was a, um, I remember reading a page in a, in um, one of my drafts, and it sort of seemed a bit boring, and uh, I was puzzled, because I remembered it as being very lively, the Russian, and um, it eventually dawned on me that, um, the most difficult words for a translator are often the very short words, um, words like ah, uh, especially, which, you know, can be, can need to be translated as and, can need to be translated as but, sometimes best not translated at all, sometimes something like whereas. Um, it does mark some sort of change of direction. It's about as near as I've got to being able to define it. And, um, I eventually realized, rereading the Russian, that um, Grossman, this was a, a passage of sort of political philosophical argument, that um, Grossman was constantly slightly changing direction. He was sort of saying something and then partly going back on it and saying it in a different way. And I'd sort of, a lot of these changes of direction were signaled by ah, a lot of sentences beginning with ah. And I'd just slightly smooth that over. So I'd sort of had Grossman just saying something in a straight line, whereas what he was actually doing was sort of zigzagging rather, which again is, you know, making the reader making the reader think. Making the reader question. Grossman is questioning himself, and that sort of makes the reader want to need to question his understanding. I kind of wonder if that is part of why he's so challenging and maybe uh just less comfortable to read overall i mean if you compare him to some other, i mean not that you have to compare him to solzhenitsyn for instance but to me this is a good example of uh uncomfortable subject matter but more or less you have instances where something is good something is bad in grossman i don't know if he really completely gives you um good and bad uh so black and white like we're talking about um, and not only is it uh, a question into the subject matter itself, but it is, right, this questioning and inquiry into humanity as a whole, which necessarily involves the reader. And that can be extremely <laughs> uncomfortable because a lot of times uh, we can look at bad things that have happened historically and say, right, well, there's no way that we would have done that, or there's no way that... Uh, that would could happen now, for instance, but there are passages in Stalingrad, for instance, that could have been written today, um, that absolutely could have been written about current events. And I'm wondering if you think perhaps the, the popularity of Grossman in the West maybe has to do with um, the fact that it, it, it can be uncomfortable. It's not perhaps black and white, or maybe is it just lack of availability? Um, until recently, of let's say, these copies of Stalingrad. Um, that's very, very interesting. I mean, reading Solzhenitsyn, I have sometimes had the sense of him, him being like a sort of prosecuting lawyer and being almost sort of pleased to discover some really sort of dreadful acts that the Soviets had done. That you know, this is kind of ammunition to 
to throw at the Soviet regime. Um, so, um, yes, and um, I mean, certainly, Grossman does, I mean, curiously, it, when I was first translating Life and Fate, which was um, in the, around 1980, um, at that time, it seemed rather old-fashioned, because that was a sort of heyday of, you know, the magical realism and then postmodernism and so on, and sort of Grossman's narrative seemed rather 19th century and old-fashioned in comparison, and um, actually took a very long time, I mean, for a long time, Grossman did not sell at all well. It wasn't until the 2000s that he really began to sell um, so yes, perhaps um, perhaps it does seem more contemporary now. I mean, I've I have I do know a couple of um, war correspondents who have been in Ukraine recently, and you know, they've been, they've been reading Grossman, right? Um, yeah, you've mentioned that in another interview, in kind of speaking about uh, Grossman. Obviously, was not just didn't just write novels about World War II or just war in general. He's got a variety of short stories that don't touch on in other novels. But, um, you know, we've talked a lot about Stalingrad and Life and Fate today. But of course, uh, of, you know, Grossman's quote unquote war novels of the war years, he also wrote first The People Immortal, which was just published this year, I believe. Um, and it's, you see, I mean, we see like a lot of attention for Stalingrad and, and Life of Fate, uh, not so much for, for, for The People Immortal. And I was kind of wanting to talk to you about how do you see the relationship between these three books? Obviously, with with Stalingrad and Life and Fate, they're you know direct directly tied together. Um, when I'm reading The People Immortal, I'm kind of struck by you know there's obviously continuity, but there's like a, I, there's a tone difference. I can't entirely capture it. Maybe that you know being a translator, you, you've seen you see it better. Maybe you disagree with that. There there is that tonal difference. But kind of how, how do you see their relationship to each other? There's been a surprising difference actually in the UK and the US. With regard to the people immortal, um, the people immortal has had a a lot of very very enthusiastic reviews in in this country. Um, very very few in the states. Um, I think probably, I mean, I have noticed this before to a lesser extent. I think probably in the states, people are more ready to um, dismiss anything where they see a hint of Soviet propaganda in it. Um, I mean, the people immortal was. It is a contribution to the war effort. I mean, it was written when. Um, I mean, it's, it's about the catastrophic re retreats at the beginning of the war, and it was written in spring 1942, when you know, the outcome of the war was far from certain. Um, so to kind of <laughs> to expect Grossman to be sort of undermining. The Soviet Union at a time like that seems pretty strange. Um, I mean, I, I'm struck by how um, how much criticism there is in that book, um, and you know there are letters which you've probably read by um, by soldiers, by officers and commissars of, of the time, um, saying that they you know, they really learned a lot. From this book, that um, the commissar, the hero Bogoryov, um, is an example that they're glad to follow. Um, I mean, obviously, well, the three books I would actually think are all very different in tone. I mean, um, the first People Immortal is a contribution to the war effort. Um, Stalingrad is primarily a, a work of memorial. Um, wanting to you know, pay respects to the to the dead, um, and a life and fate is much more more broadly philosophical. So, as we kind of approach the end of our time, which we are grateful to have spent with you, I wanted to ask if you could explain a little bit more about your next project. Um, any details that you have available to share? I know you mentioned it was. Potanov's Chevengur that you're um, currently w working towards um, completing, finally. Um, if there's anything you'd like to share uh, about that, I'd love to hear about it. Um, Chevengur is a very, very complex novel indeed. Um, 
Platonov mm-hmm. is writing on a huge number of different levels at the same time. Um, so some researchers kind of approach approach it um, entirely in terms of sort of myths and symbols. Um, others approach it as a reflection of historical reality, um, the kind of fantasies people had of the of that time of um, building a, a truly communist society in the early 1920s. Um, Platonov is, in some ways, a very kind of, his career was very opposite to Grossman's. Platonov began, his first published published book was poetry. Um, he began as a poet, um, and then wrote very complex prose in a very strange, unique language and gradually wrote more and more simply throughout his career. Um, Grossman did sort of the opposite, really. He began as a journalist, and um, I think he's a fairly unusual example of someone who wrote better and better throughout his life. Um, Some of his last stories are among the most perfect things he wrote. Um, And um, curiously, it says a lot for both of them, really, that um, both Grossman and Platonov, who were such very, very different writers, um, they were they were close friends. They really, they were both rather removed from the literary world of the time, and um, really, you know, admired each other's work enormously. And um, Grossman, um, in his last short stories, um, I think he, you know, you can see quite a lot of. Platonov's influence. Uh, I look forward to reading it once it's once it's completed. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, I have actually sent it to the publishers, but already, but I have. Um, okay. I'm still. Well, once um, it's available for my eyes. Yeah, I'm still fiddling, <laughs> fiddling about with rewriting bits of the introduction. So. <laughs> okay. Well, very, very good to speak to you both. And so, absolutely, thank, thank you. you again for your time. We really have enjoyed it. Likewise. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And before we wrap up, there are just a few final things we wanted to mention to you. Uh, first of all, this is going to be a slightly different ending than our, well, I won't say our normal ending, but the one you're used to. I just wanted to say, first of all, we hope you enjoyed our interview with Mr. Chandler. We know it was uh, later than we initially intended and even... A week later than we normally would have released and we really appreciate your patience and we really hope that you enjoyed listening to that as much as we recorded preparing for it enjoyed preparing for it and recording it and and getting to speak with mr chandler uh it was a beautiful experience especially to to cap off the last four months of reading stalingrad and the sistine madonna and, and loads of other work by grossman and and about grossman um i just wanted to say that there are two major announcements in addition to that. First of all, we're going to be going to our uh, year break, same as we did last year. We're going to be taking December off and then returning to our usual programming next January. Well, at least we'll be taking it off from posting publicly. Uh, We'll be using this time to work on something else or preparing, really, I should say. And, um, well, we may as well as introduce it in bullet point number two for things to cover we're going to be starting our next series i know we just finished one but we're getting right back into it we're starting war and peace starting this january so this december we're going to be preparing quite a bit for that series there's a lot to do a lot to read uh, and we're looking forward to it and we hope you are too uh, that will take us through a uh, part of next year, and we're gonna we're gonna keep up the same posting schedule uh, as long as we can you know continue to afford our editor um, three times a month. And we hope you you're gonna enjoy it as much as we're enjoying getting ready for it. But yeah, that this is this is a wrap for the 2022 Tipsy Tolstoy season. I guess we don't really think about it in terms of seasons, but we could look at it that way. Let's just call it that. I don't know, financial year, <laughs> whatever you want to say. Uh, thank you all for being here and listening. If you've been here from the beginning, if you've been here just uh, some number of episodes, well, it's been 70 episodes, probably not that many of you. Um, even if this is your first episode, for whatever reason, um, you know, thank you. We really appreciate you spending the limited amount of time in your day listening to us. And it's really special to get to see classroom, well, much larger than classrooms, actually, uh, sized amounts of people listening to our episodes that we just started to make for, uh, for fun, to, to utilize our skill sets about two years back. And we are looking forward to doing this 
uh, as far as we can into the future. And, and let me tell you, we already have most of 2023 planned out. Uh, we're, we're at the point where people are reaching out to us to uh, schedule, you know, talking about books or whatever. And we're kind of figuring out, okay, what do we want to move around? What can we push later? And there's so many cool ideas for 2023. I'm super excited for it. And yeah, just a, a thank you from Matt and I. And uh, we appreciate you spending your time with us. And uh, if you're listening to this when it's coming out, happy holidays uh, to whatever whatever this means uh, there's a lot of them coming up both in this month and next month so we'll do a blanket one for for everything that could possibly cover and uh thank you and we want to finish off this year by thanking the people who make our show possible at least releasing on the schedule we do possible our dear dear patrons and that's jacob elizabeth jay shannon blake amanda maya hack rob zachary Austin, Isaac, Brett, Caitlin, Eli, Julie, Stephanie, Alex, Yitza, Joanne, Mysterious Stoner Dude, Elise, Cole, Allison, Brandon, Erini, Lou, Jesse, Paige, Jack, Daniel, Darren, Daniel, Janice, Anne, Madeline, and Jeff. For all of you who have been supporting us both for a long time and relatively recently, again, you are the ones who make this show possible to be released on the schedule we do, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Okay, that's it for now. Well, actually, I should say, maybe keep an eye out in December. I, I won't say we are, we'll be posting nothing, but I also say what we might or might not be posting. We'll have to see. Well, uh, I think I've been talking for long enough, and probably most people have, have tuned out at this point. Uh, but if you're still here, again, thank you. It really is for for you listening that we do this. All right. We'll see you around Space Cowboy. Cowboy.